All right, well, uh, thanks everyone for coming, and uh, it's good to be here on Sunday morning to be able to praise the Lord and to, to uh, hopefully hear some of the Word of God. So uh, the sermon I have this morning is The Dangers of Covetousness and Envy. Um, so I want to look at uh, covetousness and envy and go through a few stories in Scripture that, uh, about the dangers, they illustrate the dangers of this sin. Um, and I have, it covered, I have covered it a little bit before, but this should be quite a different look at the subject. So uh, if you want to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I'll read to you from Exodus 18. So uh, Moses was uh, taking everything upon himself at one time and just finding there was too much work to do. Uh, where the people had too many questions. And uh, so he was given counsel to set men in judgment to help him with the people of Israel. And in Exodus 18.21, those instructions were, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So covetousness is something that will impede your ability to judge righteous judgment. And it causes us to make very unwise decisions. Um, And as saints, we are called to judge. We're called to judge all things. We're going to judge angels someday. So covetousness and envy are to be avoided at all costs. So you'll be there in 1 Timothy 6, verse 9. It says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. So we're all pretty familiar with this passage of scripture, where the love of money is the root of all evil. But what is the love of money but covetousness and envy? See, it's what you do when you desire something that's not yours or seeking after riches that don't belong to you. And it leads to many temptations and a snare. So what we are rather to be is content with what we have, not seeking after more yeah. and more things, uh, more money, more possessions, more houses, cars, boats, jewellery, whatever it be that you covet. You know, so we're supposed to trust in the Lord for our daily bread. Yeah. Uh, go out to work uh, believing that he'll provide all our necessities because he's promised. The Lord is faithful. And his promise is that he will provide all these things to us if we seek after his things first. So, and covetousness and envy are not to be confused with jealousy. See, God is jealous. It's actually one of his names. And jealousy is when you desire what's yours, something that belongs to you. So you should be jealous over your wife. You should be jealous over your children because God is jealous, jealous over his children. And it's not sin. Envy is sin. Covetousness is a sin. So when you want something that isn't yours, when you desire to have it at all costs, and when you compare what you have to other people and desire and lust for what they have, that's envy and that's covetousness. So in Romans 7 verse 7 it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said thou shalt not covet. So again, covetousness and lust are the same thing when you lust in your heart after something that's not yours uh, that's also envy and covetousness and envy is the manifestation of covetousness so looking at a house and car and saying well that looks nice that's not sin that's not covetousness or envy but when it becomes a bit of an obsession for you you know when you're looking and i must have that car i must have that house you know i must have that person's wife or whatever then it's sin and when you hate someone for what they have that's also envy, and it leads to all manner of sin. So what, what this sermon's about is about the dangers of where this can actually lead you. We all know in the Ten Commandments, uh, Exodus 20, verse 17, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. See, when we're looking at what other people have, we're not looking at what we have. And we're not appreciating it, but rather we're ungrateful and murmuring and complaining about what God's given to you. See, what they have is theirs, and what you have is yours, and we need to be content with what we have. And so whether that that can be knowledge, it can be faith, it can be a car, a home, wife, children, asses, oxen, whatever. Whatever they have, that's theirs, and we're not to covet after that. 
Uh, Luke, 13, uh, Luke 3, 14 says, And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Philippians 4, 11, he says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. 1 Timothy 6, 8 says, And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. And Hebrews 13, 5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So again, if we're content with our wages, then we're not going to steal. We're not going to deal falsely. We're not going to do violence or violate our neighbor. And that's why it says love is the fulfillment of the law. See, if we don't compare ourselves amongst ourselves, and there are people here who do more for the Lord than some, some others of us, but we don't envy them. We don't covet what they have. See, we're just all God expects of us is to do the best with what he's given us. So if you don't have the health to be able to go out there, that's fine, but just pray for the brethren who do. And, you know, serve the Lord in whatever way you can. Because we all want to do more for the Lord, so all we can do is just pray that he improves our situation so that we can do more for him. But don't envy others who are out there doing more. You know? Um, Because that's the thing, there will always be someone who's better than you, there will always be others that are worse. And it's not wise to compare yourselves to others, rather compare yourselves to Christ. And so what we want to do is compare how well we're doing with his commandments. How much do we love him? What are we doing with what he gave us? So do we increase it twofold, fivefold, tenfold? Or did we hide it in the ground? And if you hide it in the ground, when the Lord returns, it says he'll be furious. So we see in Matthew 25... Verse 24, it says, Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee not. I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou, that thou hast is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. And verse 28, Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to him which hath ten talents. So again, the purpose of today's sermon is to show that covetousness and envy may not seem like much at first, but that can lead to much worse sin. Um, And that's why the love of money is the root of all evil. You may not understand that at first, but when you actually dig into the scriptures, you'll see that the love of money leads to all manner of evil. And it does does lead to uh, fornication, adultery, murder. Uh, It leads to all kinds of wickedness. So, you know, that, that statement's not hyperbole, it's actually fact, and you can check that with the scriptures yourself. Um, but when you set your eyes on money, and you make decisions based on finances, you've pretty much already made the wrong decision. See, we should be seeking the things of God. Um, so you can't serve God on mammon. You should never make a decision based on money, it sh- and it shouldn't even enter into the equation. See, our decisions should be based on what the scripture says. They should be based on the spiritual things seeking after first the kingdom of God. And God says, I'll provide all your necessities. So if you seek after money or the things of this world, you may lose it all. Your storehouse might be burnt down and your life taken in an instant because God is jealous. If you want to turn to Luke chapter 12, uh, starting in verse 13, there's a couple passages of scripture here. We see in Luke 12, 13, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spoke a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within myself, saying, What, will, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to... Where to do, bestow my fruits and he said this will I do I'll pull down my barns and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods and I will say to my soul soul thou hast much goods laid up for many years take thy knees eat drink and be merry but God said unto him thou fool this night thy soul shall be required of thee when those things shall be which thou hast provided so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God and down in verse 29, he says, And seek not what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, neither be of doubtful mind, 
For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that you have need of these things. See, we know, the Lord knows that we need these things. Thanks, Brother Matt. The Lord knows we need these things. He knows we need food. He knows we need clothing. He knows exactly what we need. He knows we need money to provide for your families and pay your bills and everything else. So if we seek after him, he says, don't take any mine for the things of this earth. I'll take care of that. You just seek after my things. And that's where our hearts need to be. He says in verse 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, our treasure's in heaven, not in coveting the things of this earth, where moth and rust do corrupt. So we're not, we don't need to concern ourselves with, take, you know, do you need to take care of your family? Like God's given you that family. He knows what you need. So he's going to make sure you have everything you need to take care of that family. If he can feed the birds of the, of the air and the beasts of this earth, then why can't he feed you and your children? In Philippians 4, 6, it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. See, what God really wants from us is to seek him for our daily bread. We trust in him not just for salvation, but actually for our every need. See, when you take it upon yourself, you're leaving God out of it, and that's a place I don't want to be. So should we choose where we live based on where our work is, or should we go to a good church and then let God find us a job? You know, if we put the Lord first, he can find you a job. He can find you a house. He can find you anything. He will provide for you and your family. But if you're seeking after the things of the world, he might not give you a church to attend. Or he may not give you a good church anyway. Now, we know if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. And the Lord doesn't reward the lazy. He rewards the faithful worker. So if you want something, you pray to the Lord to guide you, but you have to put, it in, put in the effort and he'll reward you. So you've still got to go to work six days a week, but the Lord will make sure everything you have is sufficient. But if you pray and you don't do anything about it, you don't go looking for work or don't put any applications in or anything like that, then the Lord's not going to help you. But the Lord provides out of our own efforts. He blesses, he blesses the work that we do. So in 1 Timothy 3 verse 2, it talks about the, the bishop. It says, The bishop must then be blameless, the husband and one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behaviour, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy or filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetousness. And it says the same about the deacon as well, later in the chapter. But if pastors and deacons, you know, must not be covetousness or greedy or filthy lucre, which is money, um, they shouldn't be seeking after money with the things of God, but it's not just for them, it's also for all of us. You know, this isn't just a commandment for the bishops and the, and the pastors, this is a commandment to all men, all the children of God, that we should not be covetousness, we should not be greedy or filthy lucre. We shouldn't be seeking the things of this earth, but rather the things of God. And it says we're commanded to flee these things, because the love of money will lead you to all manner of worse sins. So from Romans 13, where we read, if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 5, Romans 13, verse 8, says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. What law is that? That's the, the Ten Commandments. It says, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. For love worketh no ill to his neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. In Proverbs, it says, verse tw uh, chapter 21, verse 25, The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labour. He coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. And so what it, why the righteous so liberal because they know the lord will provide all their needs so they put him first and they give out of not just their abundance but even their daily needs they give and the lord just rewards them for that in uh, proverbs twenty eight sixteen says the prince that wanteth understanding is also a great oppressor but he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days so if you want to live a long life then you've got to hate covetousness you've got to hate money you've, like you've got to hate the love of money you know you've got to love the things of God and uh, be focused on the things of God and the kingdom of God and the answer to that is being content 
See, we're commanded to be content with what we have. We read some scriptures earlier on that. And being envious of what others have when God has given you all that you have, that's a slap in the face to God. He's given you everything you have and you're not content with it. You're looking at everyone else's and saying, well, I'd rather have that. You know, that, that man's got a better wife than me. She behaves better. Or look at those children or a better car than me, whatever. Be content with what God's given you because he's given it to you. Amen. And that should be enough. <clears throat> but he takes it very seriously as well. So in 1 Corinthians 5, we know this, this chapter is about uh, casting out this fornicator who was in, in church. And it says in verse 9, I write unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of, out of the world. So the world is full of covetousness and extortioners and idolaters and fornicators. And it says, it's not saying we don't interact with them. But it says, Now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetousness, or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or extortioner with such an one, know not to eat. For what have I to do to, do to judge them that are without? Do not ye judge them with, that are within? Again, covetousness will ruin your judgment in these matters as well. But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So if you can be thrown out of church for covetousness and envy and it's something that will also disqualify you as a pastor if they're a covetous person, the Lord says to cast out the leaven so it doesn't destroy the whole church. The point is this body of Christ, which Christ died for, he wants to protect that, which is why he says when you see these things, you need to cast that person out till they repent and then they can come back. But what we're looking at today is how it can lead to far greater sins. So we're going to look at a story, if you want to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. <coughs> so we're going to look at uh, a very famous story, King David and Bathsheba. And this is where covetousness and envy also led to adultery, led to murder, and led to the death of an innocent child. See, David wasn't content with the wives he already had. He had multiple wives already, which he was commanded not to do. But he wasn't content with the multiple wives he did have. And so uh, he took a wife belonging to another man, and then he had that man murdered to cover for his crimes. See, had he been content with what he had, he wouldn't have even begun down this dark path. So we're going to start there in verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 11. It says, and it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Reba. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So this is the first thing. He goes up and he sees this woman and rather than turn his head, he continues to look. Um, and David sent and inquired after the woman and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David knows who it is. He's just been told exactly who it is. And David sent messengers and took her and she came in unto him and lay with her for she was purified for her uncleanness. And she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. So I just want you to pay attention to the progression of sin here. So first, he was idle and he should have been at war. Um, but he stayed home. And then he saw something he liked. He lusted in his heart. And he took action to call her over to him. So he committed adultery with another man's wife, which he knew it to be the case. And then, after that, we see he calls over the husband to try and hide his crimes. So look down at verse 6, 2 Samuel 11, verse 6. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. Verse 8. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house. And there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and went not down to his, uh, to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said to Uriah, Comest thou not from thy journey? When, why then didn't thou not go down, to, go down to thine house? 
And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to mine house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I'll let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. When David had called him, he did eat and drink before him. He made him drunk, and at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of the Lord, but went not down to his house. So this is twice. David tries to get Uriah to go down to his house to sleep with his wife. And what he wants is when that baby's born, he wants that to be raised as Uriah's child, and nobody knows about his adultery. But uh, Uriah's a good man. I see he wants, to, he wants to stay with the servants and wants to stay with the men who battled and doesn't want to go home to his, his comfortable house and sleep there with his wife. But, you know, because he loves the king and he loves the Lord, you can see Uriah was a good man of God and he was a good, a good man to the king, a loyal man. In verse 14, we see, And it came to pass in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire from him, that means to pull back from him, that he may be smitten and die. So just stop and think about that for a second. Look at how it escalated from looking upon a woman who was bathing on, on her roof to the murder of an innocent man. And that's, that is the progression of covetousness and envy. This is the love of money is the root of all evil. This is where it will lead you. This is one of those things that most people don't consider when they, when they read that statement in First Timothy. They don't think about stories like this, where it actually took place, and we have examples of where it took place. This very thing has happened. See, when you desire what's not yours, you can do all manner of things to get it. And that, you know, even to hide your sins from others, you know, because it was hi the hiding of his sin that, that led to the murder, which just escalated from looking upon a woman who was naked and bathing. And this is what the Lord says about the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So some will argue that David wasn't responsible for his death because he sent him to battle and withdrew, but the Lord actually does hold him responsible. In verse... Uh, 2 Samuel 12, verse 9, it says, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. So we see part one of the consequence of David's sin against the Lord is um, that the sword will never depart from him. It means he's going to have a lot of bloody battles. And that's another reason why he couldn't build the temple is because his kingdom was filled with blood. But we see a second consequence as well. In 2 Samuel 12, 15, it says, And Nathan, that's Nathan the prophet, departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. But see, this is the thing, it's not the end of David. It's a terrible sin that he did. And it's a warning for us, the dangers of envy and covetousness, the dangers of the lust of your own heart. But this is what it actually says about David. In 1 Kings 15, 5, it says, Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So David was a good man, a man after God's own heart. And because of this, because David took responsibility, he was actually pardoned from the Lord because David deserved to die for the sin that he did. That, that's when you commit adultery the way he did, he deserved to be put to death. But the Lord pardoned him when he, when he accepted responsibility for his sin. And that's good for us too. We know that if we go to the Lord and we confess our sin, that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and that means that, you know, we'll be spared from some of the punishments on this earth that we would have faced as a result uh, if the Lord chooses to show mercy upon us. But we see the child, however, wasn't spared. The child ends up dying. And so while David made a grievous error, he allowed his lust and covetousness of another woman lead to adultery that led, of course, 
to, to a child being conceived, to the murder of an innocent man who was a friend and warrior of David's, to finally the death of a child, all because lust was conceived in his heart and he acted upon it. And it's just a warning for us. If you want to turn to James chapter 1, after that we'll be turning to Joshua chapter 7. In James chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Blessed is he, well, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. See, like that last example, the next point is also about covetousness and envy, um, where the love of money leads to stealing and even murder or death. So, as I said, we'll be in Joshua chapter 7. I'll just give you the context. So, the context of Joshua 7 is just after the Battle of Jericho and in chapter 6, where God brought Israel great victory through a miracle. He brought down the, wall, the walls of this fortified city. Um, but the Lord instructs them in Joshua 6, 19, but all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Uh, so we see, we pick up in verse 1 of chapter 7, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing, for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. So this is a warning, you can't hide anything from God. See, he sees all and he knows all. And that's a warning for us as well. That's why, you know, 1 Corinthians 5, he says, you know, put out from among you that wicked person. It's like if you keep that wicked person within the, the house of God and the church of God, then the Lord's not going to be with us either. The Lord's going to look at us and say, you also have the accursed thing within you, and I'm going to depart from you until you get rid of that accursed thing. You need to cast those people out. Um, it's such a dangerous sin, and as well as the others, the fornication, the adultery, the idol idolatry, extortion, all those other sins as well. But see, God knew that Achan took the spoil, which was to be consecrated to the Lord. That was the Lord's that belonged to him, so he stole from the Lord. And the people were cursed, and the Lord was going to withdraw from them because of his transgression. So if you want to go down to Joshua chapter 7, verse 18, just down a bit further, it says, And he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. Tell me now what thou hast done, hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. So just take note of verse 21. We'll come back there in a second. But uh, again, we see the love of money. The man saw the, the nice things, he saw the money, the gold and the silver, he, covered, he saw them and he coveted them. 
And we'll look at what happens to his family in a second. But we just, just notice all the families were brought out in question, so it's always important to do due diligence when dealing with a serious matter, especially if some, something like casting someone out of church. Obviously, the pastor and the people will do an investigation into, you know, before they just, uh, just cast somebody out. Like, there is a process for things. But the thing is, it was so serious. The perpetrators were to be killed to make an end of the matter, so Israel would be able to have victory then in their future battles. But the Lord was clearly wroth with Achan. With Achan. Uh, went down to verse 22. So Joshua sent messages. They ran into the tent. And behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. So it was just like he said. He took them out of the midst of the tent, brought them under Joshua to the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, and his oxen, his asses, and his sheep. So anything that had, anyone that had anything to do with Achan, his whole family. Uh, it says, yeah, and all that he had. And they brought them under the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day, so the Lord turned the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor, unto this day. So again, just go back to verse 21, and just notice what it says. I coveted them and took them. So that cost him his life, it cost him the life of his children, the life of all his beasts, and everything that he had was destroyed that day his entire family name, like there would have been nothing left because the Lord was so wroth uh, with this man for stealing, for coveting. But we see that same progression where he saw among the spoils and then he took after he had coveted them. So again, coveting is what you do in your heart. It's when you go, yeah, I want that, I'm going to have that and you'll do whatever you have to to take it. Even stealing from the Lord himself, like, <laughs> that's, that's not where you want to be. But we also saw it cost Israel victory in Ai because they couldn't win without the Lord fighting for them. So the only one in Jericho because the Lord was with them. The Lord gave them the battle plan where they blow the trumpets and blow down the walls. But that was a miracle of God. They couldn't just do that by themselves. But in Joshua 7 verse 5 it says, And the men of Ai smote of them about 36 men. For they chased them down from before the gate, even unto Cherubim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. See, 36 men lost their lives in that battle, and it weakened the resolve of, of Israel to go and fight again at Ai. All because one man decided to steal. Because one man covered it and decided to steal. So to him, he was just taking some nice things for himself and his family. But look at how many people were hurt by this man's sin. See, sin always hurts others around you. Even if you don't realize it, you just think, oh, I'm just doing what's good for me, good for my family. I'm, but that can actually lead to other people getting hurt or even killed because of your greediness, because of your covetousness and envy. And that's why there's such a warning against it. That's why he says, cast out the leaven, because God doesn't want his people hurt by people like that coming in. So uh, if you want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15, we'll be looking at the story of uh, Saul and David. But I'll read to you from Proverbs 15 verse 27. It says, He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. So we see, uh, we see how uh, Saul envied David was to be king after him. Because Saul had failed to be the king that, uh, that Israel needed and that the Lord had established. Um, so he was envious of how the people looked at David because they loved him more than himself. And he was also too proud to accept another would take his place and he sought to murder David out of envy. So we're going to look at that through 1 Samuel 15 starting in verse 26 and we'll see that same progression we've seen twice already. In verse 26 of 1 Samuel 15, it says, And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned about to go away. 
He laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and it rent. So Saul's desperately grabbing onto Samuel to the point he rips his, he rips his garment. And Samuel said to him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom from Israel, kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. I mean, when God says someone's better than you, <laughs> you better take notice, that guy's better than you. This is a man after God's own heart. Again, of David, it said he did everything that was right in the eyes of the Lord except for the matter of Uriah the Hittite. That was his one major indiscretion, his one major sin. But it still led to very bad consequences for David and for the kingdom. Uh, 1 Samuel 16 Verse 1 says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long would thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So this is the time Saul's still king, but his successor has already been chosen by God. And Samuel is then told of, to go and see uh, Jesse, because one of his sons, which turns out to be the youngest David, is to be king. But it's an awkward time for both Saul and David because Saul's still the leader, but he knows he's being replaced. And David is told he's going to be the next king, but he's also just a young shepherd boy. So, and we see, but we see how David rises to be such a great warrior and great man of God through the battle against uh, Goliath and, and many other battles where he fl- uh, defeats the Philistines on behalf of Saul. But if you want to look at 1 Samuel 18, verse 6, We'll be there for a little bit. It says, And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the, woman came, the women came out of the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul, with tabrets, with joy, with trumpets and music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul lied David from that day forward. Again, <coughs> we see how Saul reacts to the news of, of being ousted and seeing that David's going to be the one to replace him, seeing how he's risen as such a great warrior, the, people, the people's hearts are towards David, not Saul. But you look at how David reacts to Saul's unjustified mistreatment and wrath towards him, and this is something we can pay great attention to. 1 Samuel 18, verse 14, it says, And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself wisely, he was afraid of him. So again, if you want your enemies to be afraid of you, all you've got to do is just, like that's why God says, love your enemies. The Lord will pour out his wrath. He'll put hot coals upon your enemies. You love your enemies. David did that to Saul, and Saul was so afraid of him uh, because he saw the Lord was with him. And he knew the Lord was no longer with it, with Saul. First Samuel 19, 1. And Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. To verse 4. And Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul his father and said unto him, Lend on the king's sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee would very good. For he did put his life in his hand, and slew the Philistine, and the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it, and didst rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. But we see that lasted about five minutes with Saul. Get into verse 9, 1 Samuel 19, 9. It says, And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul. He sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand. He was playing the instruments for, to uh, soothe Saul. It says, And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. So we see how all this started. It started with Saul's sin first. When Saul did a sacrifice he was commanded not to do, he was to wait for Samuel to do the sacrifice. Saul did the sacrifice himself, and because he couldn't admit that he was, he was wrong in that matter, the Lord didn't have favor upon him, and it, it caused him to lose the kingdom and the favor of God. But then there was another man who was ordained by God to stand in, in his stead as king. 
But he hated that man with envy because that man was revered by the people and was praised ahead of Saul for his battles. So what did it do? It led to Saul wanting to kill David out of envy for no good purpose. David had done no wrong to this man. And we need to also keep in mind that Saul's a saved man. Like quite often we, we look at people like Saul and we think, you know, he's just a wicked reprobate or whatever. He was actually a child of God. He was saved. He was a saved king as well. But you can still do such evil to even another man of God as he did to David. So we need to also not forget that we're flesh and blood and we have the same wickedness in us, in our flesh. That we just need, need to understand what we're capable of and need to you know, stay close to God and to flee from these things to flee from the lust of the flesh because this is where even just envying of another man, he's getting glorified over you and you want to kill the man because you're jealous of what he's receiving. You're envious rather, not jealous. <coughs> but even David who's on the run for his life, he doesn't dare raise a hand to Saul and that just shows the greatness of David and his heart, the man after God's own heart because the man, he was still king at that time he was still the Lord's anointed. He said, I'm not going to raise my hand against the Lord's anointed, and even though he himself was to be the next king. So that's just another good example there we have from, uh, from Saul and David. Um, but what even about Cain and Abel? Just a small example here. Cain envied his brother's righteous works of faith because his righteous works, his unrighteous works of the flesh were not received by God. So you can turn to Genesis 4 if you want to. In Genesis 4 verse 3, it says, In the process of the time it came to pass, it came brought of the fruit of the ground, an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the first things of his flock, of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, um, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain raised up against Abel his brother and slew him. So what we see here also is the world hates us, the children of God, the Christians, for the very same reason. See, they're like, a, they're like Cain. They're not right with God. But we are righteous in His sight because we have the imputed righteousness of Christ through faith. Amen. See, the world envies us. They wish they could be right with God, but they want to do it without Christ. It can't be done. Like, like Cain, you can't do it with the fruits of your own hands. See, we're righteous because we offer that offering of the Lamb slain for us, which is Christ. They offer the fruits of the works and their offering is rejected by God. And that's what makes them bitter and envious um, of us who are accepted by God. And that's how you can, know, you can see the world hates us for that very reason. There are two honourable mentions as well. How Joseph's brother sold him to slavery and faked his death for envy. In Acts 7, 9 it says, And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. And we also see Korah, Dath, and Abiram. They overthrew, tried to overthrow Moses through envy. See, they wanted the power in a position of, of being the leader of Israel. He said, look, we're just as righteous as you. But, uh, you know, they were killed by the Lord for the act of rebellion against God's anointed, which is, again, why David feared standing up against Saul. So the last point for today, and it's still a longish point, but we'll wrap it up soon. <laughs> Thanks for being patient. Um, but we're going to look at how envy led to the crucifixion of our Lord, which I think is the most important one. So while it was ordained to happen, people didn't have to take part in it. So the people who chose to take part in it were well unto them. So if you want to turn to... Uh, let's see where we'll be. You want to be in Luke 20 very shortly. Um, but after hearing the wise men, see, Herod decreed, he decrees to kill the Lord um, because the Lord was said to be king of the Jews. So that was going to encroach on Herod's authority. And what he ends up doing is slaying all children two years and younger. Christ is taken with his family, fled into Egypt. 
Um, but it was Satan, we see in Revelation 12, it was Satan who sought to slay the anointed one, who was the son of God, the Messiah. But I put it to you, they both did it through envy. See, the, Satan wants to be like the Most High. Jesus Christ is the Most High. And Herod was afraid of losing his power. And they even said the same, something similar to Pilate, uh, where the Jews said to him, you're no friend of Caesar if you let this man live. Like, because Caesar was the king over Rome at the time. So they're saying, look, this man's coming to usurp your authority. If you don't kill him, then you're not a friend of Caesar's. In John 8, 44, it says, You are of your father the devil, speaking to the Pharisees at the time, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. See, the children of Belial, and they're the ones who murdered our Lord, the Pharisees, the leaders, as well as some in the crowd. Some of the crowd were just riled up, and so they went along with it. You know, they went reprobate. But there were a lot of reprobates, children of Belial, who were calling for the crucifixion of our Lord. And the reason they killed the Lord was they wanted to steal his inheritance. See, the Lord gives us his inheritance freely. He shares the inheritance with all the sons of God, all the children of God. He says we're set to inherit all things. Ephesians 1.11 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So all who trusted in Christ, that's all of us here, all who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, says we have obtained an inheritance. Hebrews 6.11 says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. See, we inherit through faith and patience. So we're still waiting for the resurrection of our bodies. That's the patience of the saints. But the faith is trusting in Christ, and we've done that already. Hebrews 9.15 says, for, for this cause he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that they which are called might receive the promises of eternal inheritance. Colossians 3.24 says, Knowing that the, of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. And of course, Revelation 21.7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God and he shall be my son. See, that's our inheritance. These are the beautiful promises of God. Uh, and it's to every single one of us that have trusted in Christ. That's our hope and expectation. But there are those who want to steal it from us. That's where it talks about these are thieves and robbers. See, they want what we, what we have, but they don't want to go through Christ to get it. They want eternal life, but they want it without the Lord. They want to enter in through the back door. There is no back door. There's no other way to heaven but by Christ. And it says thieves and robbers describes those who try to take it with violence. And the, the Jews killed Christ for envy. And it was the rulers as well as many of those who were following after them. So they want the promises, but they know not the Lord. They don't believe in the Son, and they don't have the Father. So if you're there in Luke 20, starting in verse 13, and the Lord's giving a parable here. It says, uh, Then said the Lord to the vineyard, What? The Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? I'll send my beloved son. It may be that they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen, and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And the chief priests and scribes the same hour sought to lay hands on him, and they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. And they were right about that. 
and, he, and they watched him and sent forth spies which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words, that they might deliver him under the power and authority of the governor. So this is, of course, speaking of how the Lord, throughout the history of Israel, he sent prophets to them, prophets like Elijah, Jeremiah, you know, you've got all the Old Testament prophets he sent to them. But he says they've killed the prophets from Abel to Zechariah. They're responsible for the blood of all the prophets. That, ne- that generation of Israel at that time, those scribes and Pharisees. We'll see in a second they even admit to that themselves. But last of all came down himself, the son of God, and they sought to kill him too, to take the inheritance. Because they want the inheritance without Christ, without the Lord. And it's such a powerful parable. If you want to turn to Matthew 23, starting in verse 29, we'll look at what the Lord says about this generation. But w- what we saw in Luke 20 is they like to infiltrate, they like to destroy, they like to persecute the Lord's people. And they want to kill those who do the work of the Lord because they envy the righteous. This is what the Apostle Paul was doing before, while he was Saul, before his tr- transformation, before the Lord came to him and said, look, you know, it's hard to kick against the pricks, Paul. Saul, you know... It's like you're doing so much damage to my people, you think you're doing the right thing, but you're really not. You're killing my, my prophets, you're killing, you know, my saints. And when Paul realized what he was doing, you know, he loved the Lord genuinely. Uh, he was just doing it in ignorance. But again, you just see how envy can lead to murdering innocent people, especially God's people, because they killed all the prophets out of envy. <coughs> So we also need to be careful about watching for people who want to infiltrate a place like this, where they want to destroy us from within. And you will get false prophets, false teachers. You read through all the New Testament, they're talking about the circumcision coming in, trying to teach men that they need to be circumcised to be saved, bringing in false gospels, teaching them to keep the law, to keep the Sabbath. And this is, this is not how it should be. We, we know what the Bible says, so these people need to be cast out. They're leaven that will destroy this, ch- this church. And <coughs> so the Bible says they are, they're thieves and robbers and murderers. But if you look in Matthew 23, 29, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. So what they do is like the, the prophets, like Elijah and all of that, like those who had sepulchres, they would garnish them and make them look nice and say, oh, you know, these are our people, these are our prophets. Um, But look at what it says. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. See, these people are no different to their fathers. They're hypocrites. They say, we wouldn't have done that, and yet they do. They're doing that that very day. And all through the book of Acts, you see the same people doing the same things their fathers did to the prophets. In verse 34, Wherefore, behold, I send, you unto the, unto you, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall cru- kill and crucify. Some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation." Imagine the Lord saying that to you. Like, wouldn't that make you afraid? Like, to know that this generation is going to face the consequences for all the previous generations who slew all the prophets, all that righteous blood. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent to thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? And ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. See, they rejected the Lord and they persecuted his saints even unto death. And it says in the scriptures they killed him for envy. Um, So we know that to be the case, because the Lord knows the hearts of men. I'll just read to you a couple of verses. Matthew 27, 18 says, For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Uh, in Mark 15, 10, it says, For he knew the chief priests had delivered him for envy. In Acts 13, 45, it says, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Acts 17, 5, But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, 
took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. These are your children of Belial. They're the reprobates. And gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. <coughs> and this is when Israel curses themselves in Matthew 27. It says, When Pilate saw he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. And in verse 25, Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Now why would you curse yourselves like that? These people really hated God. They really hated the Son of God. And these are not, these are not God's chosen people. These are the devil's chosen people. These are Satan's children, children of Belial. <coughs> see, they cursed themselves with that. And we see that not one stone was left upon another in that temple, the one that they loved so much. And Jerusalem, the city, was laid desolate by the Lord. He used the Roman armies in the first century to do that. And he brought judgment against that generation as he promised he would. See, they weren't the people of God, but we that are of faith are the people of God. And we need to remember that. Uh, in John chapter 8, verse 53, speaking to the Pharisees again, Are thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honour myself, my honour is nothing. It's my Father that honoureth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and thou hast seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took, up, uh, then took up the up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So Jesus said, Look, I'm God. I am is a name of God. So when he says, Before Abraham was, I am, he's saying, I'm God. This is a declaration Christ is making, and that's why they wanted to stone him to death, because he made himself equal with God, because he is God. Jesus is the Son of God. But their God was not the Father, because Jesus is the Son of the Father, and for that they wanted to kill him. They didn't believe he was the Christ, the Messiah. So what is the inheritance for us? So the Spirit is quickened the moment we believe. It's made alive. It's born again. And in the future, we'll receive a new body equal to that, that uh, sinless um, spirit that we have, the new man. We'll receive a sinless body as well to forever dwell in the new heaven and new earth, in the new world God creates for all his children. It's the heavenly Jerusalem that descends out of, his, out of heaven, which is the, um, which is the bride. Um, and we're going to live and dwell there forever. Um, but we also have something as well. We have direct access to the Father, which is something they want, but they can't have without Christ. And again, brings them to envy towards us and wants to kill us for that very reason. <coughs> See, we don't have to worry about where we're going to be when this body dies. I know exactly where I'll be. Because as Brother Jason uh, Parkin preached not long ago, we're seated in heavenly places. Like, we're already seated there, but that's part of the inheritance is that we're seated in heavenly places. Um, there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. There's going to be rewards handed out, like all the beautiful blessings that God's promised to us who believe on His Son. And that's the inheritance we share with Christ, because all of this is Christ's inheritance. But He wanted to be the first of many brethren, and He wants to share it with every single one of us. And that's why Christ is the one giving out the rewards, because it's His inheritance, and He's get sharing it with us based on how, we, how well we do in this earth. He rewards us according to, to how well we do. But how, just how wonderful are those promises? I'll just read to you. Uh, if you want to turn to John chapter 10, uh, I'll read to you from Galatians 3, 29. And if you be Christ, then, you're Ab then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And Titus 3, 7, that being justified by grace... We should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we inherit the inheritance through faith 
and there's no other way to inherit the kingdom of God. There's no other way to get eternal life. So, and we look at the Jews killed Christ. They're thieves and robbers trying to take the kingdom for themselves, trying to enter in the back door. But those who hear his voice and believe on Christ, they're the sheep of the shepherd. Uh, John 10 verse 7 says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. I am come that they might have life, they might have it more abundantly. Uh, verse 16, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also must I bring, that they shall hear my voice and shall be one fold and one shepherd. See, there were the Jews who wanted to crucify Christ out of envy, but then there were also those who were Israelites indeed, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ when he came. They were of his sheep. They heard him gladly when he came. And they, followed, they even followed him when they heard John the Baptist and Jesus come. They knew the voice of the shepherd and they followed him. So there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, the barbarian, the Scythian, male nor female, and the kingdom of God. We're all one in Christ Jesus. So, and that's where it's important to understand that it's, you know, there are those that hate God, you know, and while certain groups are certainly overrepresented in, in those who hate God, you know, there are still saved Jews, there are still saved brethren, um, you know, who have believed on the Lord and are children of God just like us. Um, so there are those who try to enter in through works or any other way but Christ but they're also thieves and robbers they want the inheritance without Christ and that's just not possible so they'll be cast into outer darkness but if you've believed on Christ and Christ alone then you are part of that inheritance and every promise in that book is for you so just to wrap it up now what can we take away from this as children of God, as heirs of the inheritance, the dangers of seeking after fleshly lust is far worse than you can imagine. Just remember some of the stories we have in the scriptures about men who did horrific things because of the lust of their heart, which led to even worse sins. And there are real consequences to sin. There is the chasing of the Lord, but also just on this earth you can be punished just by the criminal system or, or whatever for some of the sins um, that are also illegal. And the Lord may cause you, you to go through that if, if you're not repentant about your sin. You know, you need to be humble like David. Take responsibility before the Lord. And, you know, while there are still heavy cons consequences for David, he himself received the pardon for that particular sin. But we need to petition the Lord for our desires according to his will and not according to the lust of our own flesh. So the last passage I'll read before we wrap up is James chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because you ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whereso, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think the scripture says in vain, the, saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Again, it's at the end of the day, what the Lord wants from us is to come to him in prayer. If you've got desires in your heart, don't let it become covetousness and envy, where it becomes bitterness against people and you hate them because they have something you want. But rather, go to the Lord and say, Lord, you know what's on my heart? I would like to have this, but if it's not according to your will, then so be it. But just pray to the Lord. That's what he wants. He wants us to come to him for, his da for our daily bread. Amen. He wants us to come to him for our heart's desires. Um, and yeah.
So uh, let's just end in a word of prayer.